cracking. So, um, hello again, everyone from around the world. Already over a hundred participants this week. We are presenting with Dr. Pascal Perez Paredes uh, from the University of Murcia in Spain. He's an internationally renowned scholar on numerous things, but what you what what I know him most perfect uh, uh, most for is for his work on DDL, the use of corpus technology for language learning. Now, Pascal today is going to present for us on data-driven learning in informal contexts, which I'm sure uh, everybody's going to find fascinating. I'm very interested to see how that can work and what some of these informal contexts might be. And looking forward to seeing that. Before we begin, uh, again, I'll just ask everybody to mute their microphones and to turn off their webcams so as to present dis uh, prevent disruption for tonight's speaker. And as is usual with all public events in Australia, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet, paying our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And we recognize their valuable contributions to Australia and global society. Now, Dr. Pascal Perez Paradise, Professor in Applied Linguistics and Linguistics at the University of Murcia, uh, and was a lecturer uh, at a um, place where I did my PhD studies and where I have many fond memories at the University of Cambridge. Uh, his main research interests are in the use of corpus linguistics and technology, corporate digital resources in language analysis and education. He's developed an array of applications, which many of you may know, such as the text encoding initiative and uh, the annotation of pedagogic spoken corpora, in particular Sacadel and Backbone, which incorporates the Sarkadel Corpora. He produced a number of books on corpus linguistics for education, uh, numerous papers, and he's the Corpus Linguistics Strand Coordinator for AAAL and Assistant Editor of Recall. So uh, without any further ado, I'd like to introduce tonight's speaker, Pascal, and I'll let you take it from here. If you could just unmute Pascal. All right, can you hear me? I can hear you. Uh, your PowerPoint's currently showing. Oh, no, there we go. Yeah, we yeah, okay, should be thank fine. you. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you so much for this uh, invitation to join this event. And I'm so glad to see that this event is um is not only happening it is happening again this year so i want to congratulate you peter and and your team on putting these uh, event uh together uh, i think that the first edition was a fascinating uh, edition with uh, many interesting talks in the in the in the lineup so i think we should all be grateful uh, uh to you to your team to your university uh, for giving uh, all of us the opportunity to hear researchers, speakers, and what's going on and in uh, data-driven learning, the use of corporate for language education, and in general terms, the use of corporate linguistics in language education. So, yeah, um, thank you again, Peter, uh, for this invitation. Okay. Um, um, I'd like to share today with you uh, what I think is a thought-provoking discussion on the role of innovation in data-driven learning and possibly the use of uh, new types of data, new types of, let's call them corpora, and research methods in language learning and situate those within a very broad scope of 
what we may call data-driven learning in the 21st uh, century. So my talk today looks at uh, uh, the use of or research in informal contexts in, in language learning and the, um, and the scope for data-driven learning in those uh, informal contexts. And also I want to properly discuss what these contexts can reveal about data-driven learning, which I think is, is an important question in terms of moving the discipline forward. Um, I'd like to start by, by um, um, just uh, doing a little bit of, uh, of uh, uh, time, a little bit of time traveling back to the past to one of my papers in 2010, where I was, um, I was thinking about um, the impact of the use of corpus linguistics in language education and what I felt at the time, I'm talking about, you know, just research in the, in the late years of the 20th century and the early years of the 21st century, where I conceptualized back then as what I call the possibilities uh, scenario, which is a scenario where um, corpus linguists, including myself, we take corpus linguistics research methods to the language classroom and uh, corpus linguistics tools for analysis to the to the language classroom and and we explore the limits and the possibilities of of those tools and those data sets or corpora in the in the language classroom and and i was in and in in this chapter i was probably discussing um, whether this is this is one of the many scenarios that we could you know look at as as researchers and whether there's other you know scenarios uh, available to to researchers ddl researchers data driven learning researchers uh, looking at the use of corpora in the in, in language classrooms um and it's just uh, i i find it so interesting that we have just published a, a chapter in the new edition of the Rutledge Handbook of Corpus Linguistics, uh, edited by Anouk and Mike McCarthy, where we sort of discuss the, the contribution of, of corpora to language learning, and we sort of explore the, the many language learning uh, scenarios that, that are available to, uh, to researchers and mainly to, to language learners, and we we are trying to acknowledge in this chapter um, this um, these very wide scope in terms of uh, what language learning means for most learners uh, out there. So in a way, it's kind of a full circle thing, you know, like uh, there's 12 years in between this first chapter and this new chapter that I've just published with, with Gelmark and um, where we are interested in looking at a wider a conceptualization about um, language learning. Um, in this very handbook, the same handbook, uh, Angela Chambers has written a wonderful chapter on data-driven learning. And um, um, Angela Chambers wrote in her chapter something which I th that, that caught my attention. Uh, she wrote something, I'm going to read this one. Um, she said that despite the very substantial body of research which uh, exists on DDL and increasing availability of resources, it seems clear that there is still ample scope for uh, developments. So I want to situate my talk today, my discussion today within these, these, this area, within this area of you know, this uh, scope for further development and contribution to to new forms of data-driven learning and especially research in, uh, in data-driven learning. So in this talk, um, I will share a few thoughts on data-driven learning in 2022. So I will be um, visiting some very recent uh, chapters and papers on data-driven learning. Some of those were published in this volume that I just edited with with gel mark beyond the concordance lines. I will also visit two scenarios for data-driven learning in informal contexts. One is uh, what I call here statistical learning, 
uh, or the res research in statistical learning and the other one is the use and research in the use of of uh, mobile apps or language learning apps or apps that facilitate language learning and i would like to conclude this talk with a few thoughts um, my idea is that um, we could share an, a nice uh, discussion uh, at the end of the session uh, looking at some of these ideas and see how we can all make sense of the of the opportunities that uh, informal contexts for language learning can offer to to researchers and mainly to uh, to language learners, I suppose. Okay, um, I think we will all agree that uh, data-driven learning researchers have been able to show evidence that data-driven learning DDL works in classroom contexts. So uh, all the recent meta-analyses in this area really tell us a, a, a success uh, story. Uh, uh, data-driven learning has shown evidence that it is, it is not only useful, it, uh, we have shown evidence that data-driven learning facilitates language learning and language gains. So I think we should we should congratulate uh, ourselves. Uh, probably this wasn't the case, let's say 20 years ago, where we could find claims that you know more evidence is needed, more empirical, uh, empirical evidence is needed to show that data-driven learning is, is, is effective in language classroom. However, my impression is that there is a general sense that we could something like we could be doing more. And uh, this is something that I have the feeling it is pretty much all over the place in, in recent data-driven learning literature. I want to show you just a few uh, examples here. Um, this is the chapter contributed by Alex Bolton on the in this uh, Beyond Concordance Lines uh, volume. Um, here, um, Alex feels that uh, writes that there is uh, the what he calls the strategic imperative for future research that, of course, not only looks at other languages, uh, I mean, other than than, than English. Uh, and the use of, you know, a wider range of different types of corpora, um, the use of free resources that are not, you know, behind paywalls and, you know, so that, that, that idea is very well established in the, in the literature. And I think that pretty much everybody in this, in this, uh, 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 in this talk, uh, or in this chat or in this presentation will probably uh, agree uh, to to this one. Um, but also I found it interesting that uh, there is the need here or the perceived need here to include new tools that can be used along with traditional corpora in data-driven learning. One of those is the use of the web as, as a corpus, something that has been pretty much debated in corpus linguistics over the last, let's say, 25 years. The use of data-driven learning for mobile tools, the implications of regular teachers who are not researchers and authors so that we can achieve a, you know, greater integration into existing courses out there in language learning especially outside university classrooms. And um, pretty much, um, a, a, again, this sense that this is, this is just some of the things that we, we could be doing in order to expand the, the application of data-driven learning. Um, in a, a paper also contributed by Alex Bolton and Nina Vietkina recently, in language teaching and technology. They also um, acknowledge, and this is the uh, 30 years of data-driven learning uh, paper, which is, which is a great paper. I recommend everyone to read this one. Um, 
that they um, they also um, engage the readers with the idea that um, it may be a good idea to to sort of look at how um, skills such as critical thinking, independent learning, learner autonomy also make their way into data-driven learning research. They also mentioned that most of these ideas tend to be found in the uh, conclusion sections in most of the research papers out there. But according to them, there is no direct uh, exploration of these concepts and uh, in terms of research objectives. I think this is, this is very relevant. So these uh, opportunities to research, again, critical thinking, independent learning, uh, autonomous language learning, seems, seems that they are not making their way, or they're not making an impact in the research agenda of uh, DVL researchers. They also said something which I think is, is very relevant. They talk about the fact that simple, what they call simple early tools are still used to research and teach languages and learn languages through DDL, right? So they talk about uh, concordances, uh, frequency lists, collocations, and the use of clusters and keywords. Uh, so they mentioned that we've been using these, these for at least 20, 30 years, right? Which in a way probably is also adding to this field, all right? So maybe, maybe we could be doing more in terms of researching GDL, right? And um, which, you know, leads them to, to state that these same procedures have remained unchanged since the early research days. Um, and of course, uh, a final point here, uh, the fact that most of the research has been conducted in universities. So with university uh, students. So we know very, very little about what's going on in other, in other, um, 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 in other classrooms, right? Um, so this is something that it is beginning to change and the contribution of Peter Crossweight in this, in this area, I think is very relevant. Uh, Anna Kiev also in uh, 2021 in, in the uh, Beyond the Concordance Lines volume, she talks about a very interesting client, a client where we can have or we can pay attention to learning that is heavily teacher mediated versus learning which is student mediated. And uh, I find these uh, very interesting. Um, so in, these, in this client, we can see that probably we have seen more research towards the, the, the client where teachers become mediators and in, in the language learning process for language learners, and maybe there is less, uh, you know, uh, attention paid to the role of uh, self-mediation or uh, student self-directed uses in terms of uh, the type of resources that we know to be more popular in data-driven uh, learning. So she mentions the lack of control over the learning outcome and the teachers lots of control uh, in terms of what the students are doing with these uh, uh, corpus or corpus data, which is probably um, uh, in a way contributing uh, uh, towards the over presence of situations, learning situations where teacher mediation is, is more prominent in, in research. So again, you know, we are we are looking here at different authors that are sharing this this sense of all right. So there's the some areas that 
that could be of potential interest that are not, you know, are not gaining our our attention here. Right. Also, uh, Anna Kiev in, in her chapter, she talks about the relevance of, of theory driven models for language learning, and she she talks about the uh, usage based uh, uh, model and the attention concepts and constructs such as uh, frequency, recency and, and context and the opportunities that that these um, that these may uh, give to researchers in terms of looking at how these constructs actually operate through the use or by means of the use of of um, corpus data so yeah we could be doing more chambers in her uh, chapter on data driven learning just published just a few days ago in the in the Rodledge handbook of corpus linguistics uh, as you can see there uh, in a way, um, we can find here this very strong implication that that data driven learning only happens in instructed language contexts, right? So uh, th that's the the default kind of option uh, in in terms of of how we see how we conceptualize uh, data driven le uh, learning. So again, um, and I also also found Peter your your talk on uh, I think that the title was "Is Data Driven Learning Dead?" I found that also very interesting and thought um, um, thought provoking. So I pretty much invite everyone to listen to 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 this one in this in this talk. Peter also things about whether DDL could be doing more also in terms of accommodating new ways or new ways in which language learners are using uh, uh, information for their language learning. And also um, the, uh, the fact that um, in a way, um, whether DVL really feels like like an option for for uh, everybody, and I'm also thinking whether we researchers how we are contributing to this general feeling that probably DVL is not for everybody by not looking at some areas of uh, language learning uh, uh, across different. Um, uh, levels or institutions or ways in which data driven learning is presented to to language learner. Right. So maybe I was thinking um, coming back to to Alex Bolton's twenty ten paper, whether we need a new equation to to expand the impact of 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 data of data driven data driven learning. Um. I'm sure that everyone has their favorite definition for what data-driven learning is. I like Smart's uh, definition. Um, uh, 20, this is a 2014 uh, paper in Recall, where um, he finds that data-driven learning is defined or characterized by the use of real data as sources of language learning and uh, mm, a, a an approach where learning activities are student centered and focus on language discovery. So I think this is a really broad definition. Uh, I can take that there's other more restrictive definitions, and um, I've always liked this one. I think it's it it has the potential to encompass new approaches and more innovative uses and. Um, research areas within DVL. So um, really DVL has been looking mostly at highly controlled activities in, in instructed contexts, mainly in university education, and has paid very, very little attention to, to what we may describe as experiential learning or, or learning in the wild, as some people call it these days. 
my argument today is that we can try to do more in order to bridge the gap between these two uh, uh, ends, right? Between this research of, of uh, environments where teachers have a highly controlled uh, environment in, in, in terms of the activities and the data that is presented to students and the other end of the of this continuum where you know just language learners typically just uh, make use of whatever resources they find for uh, language learning without the mediation or without any tool which is provided by language uh, by language teachers or by or um, institutions if they are a member of an institution uh, at all so i want to make the claim today that we can we could draw from um, in interesting um, areas of research in second language acquisition, such as statistical learning, and we could also draw from other areas of research in computer-assisted language learning, and in particular, we could draw from mobile-assisted language learning, and these two uh, different areas of research could also uh, inform our, our approach to research of DDL in informal contexts. So what do, what do we mean by informal language uh, um, learning? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing here on, on a nice chapter by Gawain Johns in the, in the handbook of uh, informal language learning, um, where um, in a way we can, we can find some good reasons why research in informal learning has been challenging for, for language researchers. Uh, number one, clearly this area is underrepresented in, in not only in DDL, of course, but in um, second language learning acquisition. And it's, it is only now that it is beginning to, to, to capture the attention of researchers in, in second language acquisition in a more significant way. Um, this is probably so for many different reasons. Uh, of course, uh, language learning in the wild just 30 years ago probably um, and entailed probably, uh, you know, just um, having uh, informal encounters with, uh, um, you know, other languages through traveling or through close associations with the speakers or of, of the language or maybe it was more limited to a selection of, of either films or books that one could either rent or, or buy from, from just a selected group of, of bookshops. So it was, it, was, it was not so widely available, uh, uh, this, this language learning uh, in the wild or self-directed access to language learning just uh, again 30 years ago 20 years ago however uh, it is difficult to to analyze and to look at uh, informal language learning according to goldwyn johns this is mainly because it is difficult to document how language learning happens in informal contexts and this has in a way made it more uh, challenging for researchers to look at these contexts Another reason is that input in informal environments is not structured. And this is usually something that, of course, language teachers don't like uh, for different reasons. We like uh, 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 our syllabus. We like to structure the way we teach. We like to make informed choices in terms of our methodologies, in terms of the language that is to be taught in a language classroom. So this is, this is not the case in informal learning contexts. And um, in terms of understanding the scope of informal learning, um, I like uh, Chick's uh, theoretical framing of uh, informal learning, where he uh, looks at five dimensions for uh, informal learning. One of them is the locus of control, uh, learner's locus of control, which again, it's highly tight in, in, in classrooms and it is in a way it is directed and mediated by language teachers and in informal 
um, language learning uh, students or learners learners have um, 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 a lot of power in terms of deciding what these locus of control. So what things will be learned and what is exactly the 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 contents and the language that needs to be learned. So uh, arguably this has made uh, research in informal learning contexts uh, really challenging. However, um, just um, again, probably this is this is not uh, good enough, right? Just uh, you know, just thinking. All right, well, yeah, maybe this is too challenging, and there is no way we can we can probably look at these at these contexts. Probably it's it's something that in a way will reinforce this sort of idea that we could be doing more, but at the same time, we are not doing it because it is challenging. So kind of, of, a, of a situation we feel trapped and, and um, you know, a, a situation where there is constant complaints about um, the lack of innovation and the lack of moving forward in terms of research in data-driven uh, learning. So I think, and I agree here with, with Gokusko, Ham and Lee that, um, we really need to think about, we need to propose, as they say, we need to propose new designs for, for language learning in, in informal settings, informal contexts or informal settings that can really tell us more about how language learning happens and how data-driven learning, or at least a, uh, a, a new version of data-driven learning or a 21st century version of data-driven learning uh, can, be, uh, can be used, can be found in these, in these contexts. So I want to have a look at um, researching statistical learning and the opportunities that researching statistical, uh, statistical learning sorry, can offer to uh, data-driven learning uh, researchers. So this is what I call the uh, first uh, scenario, right? Uh, I think that we will all agree that uh, the, 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 the final aim for uh, um, language learners using DDL is to find, detect, discover patterns uh, in the data, right? I like this, this quote uh, by Alex Bolton. Uh, again, this is the 2010 paper. Patterns, regular patterns in the data that are meaningful to them. Um, so I think that is very relevant, right? Um, I've also written and spoken about doing data-driven learning without the learners. And I think this is also an area that needs more attention if we want to have a greater impact in terms of, of you know, how DDL is 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 conceptualized and used uh, widely uh, across across the board across different institutions and learning situations. Um, also, I think that part of that uh, detection of regular patterns is connected with um, one clear area of research for statistical learning, which is how we form how learners, we human beings form categories for the input that we are exposed, right? We could call this abstracting categories from ambient input, right? So I think we could all agree on this one here. Of course, this is inspired by usage-based um, language learning theories. And according to these theories, um, these, these abstracting constructions in usage based theory or abstracting language in, in probably in a, in a uh, non cognitive linguistics probably uh, environment, we could agree on that one. It really is something that happens or it is extracted from meaningful input and the interaction of learners with these, this input. And this input is again determined uh, by, by the frequency in which this input is, is, is found and how this is interpreted by language learners, right? So 
data-driven learning is interested in patterns, usage-based uh, uh, theories are interested in, in abstraction and how we extract uh, uh, language or linguistic knowledge from, from the input through, through uh, categorization. And I think we have good news. We also uh, know these days that uh, adults really um, offer some cognitive advantages uh, over children or kids when learning foreign languages. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about um, situations of, of language learning where uh, somebody has already acquired a first or more than a first uh, language, all right? Um, um, statistical learning in, in, in the literature is conceptualized as a form of implicit learning where uh, language um, learners are presented with language material and where they are not given you know, any sort of, of instruction in terms of how this material, how language is to be picked up or learned right so people learn through exposure to um, instances to examples or to language right so here what we can see is that there is domain general uh, mechanisms that uh, operate through the, um, uh, through the language learning experience and uh, human beings and also other other mammals also um, are well uh, suited to uh, extract regular regularities from from information, right? In this case, uh, statistical regularities from 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 the input, right? We also know that metalinguistic awareness favors L two learning. We know that metalinguistic awareness helps um, um, learners categorize uh, the input in the L two. We also know that learners that are metalinguistically aware also are more likely to identify uh, uh, rule-governed uh, systems and the rules behind behind these these systems. And we also know that multilingual learners are probably uh, better at doing this, at at you know uh, extracting these regularities. So. You know, I think this is really good news. And this is a body of knowledge that has merged in the last 20 years or so, right? And we also know that both uh, an explicit and implicit uh, learning actually uh, uh, interface uh, with how language is represented in our, in our brains. We also know that adults uh, can handle larger input data sets than, than um, um, kids or, or young adults, right? This is a great uh, research by Lef uh, Ari, um, where they looked at um, uh, vowel perception in social media. That's a fascinating study, All right? And also, I found this really interesting, the mention to virtual informal environments as environments that may present opportunity, not only for language learners, but also for researcher, uh, researchers as, as, a, as a space, as a ground to try to know more about how these processes uh, actually uh, happen. So, this, I think this links pretty well with, with some areas of research in data-driven learning, such as noticing or attention to form that I think I discussed in my 2020 talk plenary, I think have been poorly treated in data-driven data -driven learning. And uh, probably we could, I think also I feel that we could do better, right? So I think we could probably research generalization in a more principled way. We just take it for granted that generalization is one of the steps that happen whenever we are identifying, uh, you know, just concordance lines and we examine contexts of, of use. But there is uh, 
there is, you know, just further need to understand how this is happening on a, on a more principled way, uh, I guess. Um, also, uh, we know very little uh, about um, the sort of language that learners, for example, to in a way describe or, or represent these patterns, right? Something that, for example, in mathematics is a, is, is a key area of research, right? So a generalization in mathematics to extract patterns has done uh, extensive research in this, in this area. And for example, we very rarely explore different types of uh, generalization across DDL, right? So you know, again, we could, I feel we could, we could do better. I've, I've written about computational thinking. I've done this in uh, Spanish with uh, Miguel Zapata. So probably um, you are not very familiar with this, but I think this is an interesting area of, of research. So in a way, my feeling is that statistical learning and, and language learning are really, and research in language learning across digital contexts offer uh, opportunities for maybe the use or the application of the exploration of not only new corpora, but uh, new roles for corpora, right? I just want to throw here just a few areas where I think this could be of interest. For example, in the use or research in uh, digital spaces such as fan fiction reading and fan fiction writing. I'm thinking about the research, fantastic research by by Sanon uh, Soro in this in this area, and 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 how these reading and writing could benefit from the use of 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 uh, ad hoc corpora, right? So corpora that will be of interest to these language learners taking part in these in these uh, sites of engagement. Um, also, uh, spaces where there is collaboration outside the classroom through mobile devices, right? Um, we did a little bit of res research in this area. Um, um, Valendia de Pedemar and myself back uh, in the day, a few years ago, 10 years ago, when looking at the use of wikis and, and, and uh, forums to foster collaboration between, you know, learners in different countries engaged in, in different tasks. Uh, of course, that was within an, an instructed language learning context, right? Or, for example, the use of video and video streaming and the use of corpus data uh, uh, from these videos or from these uh, TV shows or uh, of, of films, how these could also create the opportunities to, uh, to interact with language data in a meaningful way for these learners interested in this experiential learning. So we know very little about these areas and the, and the use of language related uh, information. Right, the use of digital narratives that is a fantastic opportunity to explore data contributed uh, um, by language learners in informal contexts that read and write in a in a given uh, narrative uh, situation. Right, a fantastic book by Francisco Yus published also last year on this one. Second scenario, the res research in um, mobile uh, uh, apps or the use of, of, of um, mobile devices, right? Um, I like John Traxler quote from a 2018 paper where he talks about language learning apps as the a, epitome of the transformation um, of mobile technology from obscure, fragile, expensive, impersonal to something which is perceived these days as universal, uh, robust, easy, obvious, and cheap. And uh, the fact that probably there is this, probably this is over expectation that mobile apps will in a way find a solution to most of our problems in, in our societies. A great um, 
a paper by Lai and Cheng 2018. This is a meta-analysis of mobile assisted language learning. They performed a, a factor analysis to understand the uses of these of, of mobile for language learning. They found that in, in the research that was published back then before 2018, this is found to be useful for personalization and autonomous, what they call customized language learning. Also, mobile is used to engage in authentic learning experiences, so experiential learning. And finally, uh, mobiles as a, a facilitator uh, of, of contact with native speakers uh, of the L2. This study was based in Hong Kong with language learners. I think it's, it's an, an interesting one. Uh, also, Goldwyn Johns talks about the widespread use of um, uh, mobile apps for language learning in the context of the 21st century, looking at the needs of, of learners that probably we didn't have in mind just 20 years ago, such as uh, refugees or migrants or displaced populations. So we can see more of these implementations every day but also uh, mobile devices and mobile apps as providing real world context uh, for engagement uh, with different cultures and language use. And here's, I don't want to forget about uh, Blomert uh, uh, terminology. Sorry, that was uh, 20, 2011, sorry about that. That should be 20, 2011, not 2021, obviously, right? a Blomart concept of super diversity of, of, of populations that are becoming increasingly bilingual, right? So we still, I feel, we feel trapped in the monolingual fallacy in, in DDL. So I don't know, can we do something about that? I think that's another area that needs our attention. However, there is very little in, in terms of data-driven learning and mobile uh, uh, apps or mobile applications for data-driven learning. There's a nice study by Quan 2016, where they, they used uh, uh, mobile devices to present academic uh, vocabulary in instructed language contexts. Um, um, I also did with, with many other colleagues in the context of, of a, a European project, a little bit of research into using a prototype that streamlines web services that foster a statistical learning uh, for language learning and the use of, of metrics for writing uh, across different levels in English. Um, Again, that is a very preliminary type of research using mobile devices and some, some broad view of data-driven learning. Also, Peter Crossweight has been looking at the use of, of uh, online language learning uh, with a range of different uh, courses, in this case, also in instructed language contexts, right? Um, to, to, to teach different areas of, in this case, English. So the, the feeling is that uh, despite the, the overpresence of, of, for example, uh, mobile technologies uh, in our daily life, there is very little engagement with, with that sort of range of, of applications and possibilities also in terms of using data-driven learning for to, to, to favor, of course, uh, uh, informal learning. Um, in the chapter that Alex Bolton contributed to Beyond, the, uh, Beyond Concordance Lines, he said that um, it, is, it is, in a way, it is challenging that to find instruments that researchers uh, uh, can use to to explore some areas uh, of language learning. He said that we need to know more about user-generated queries in, in DDL if we really want to know more about uh, how DDL works in terms of individual users uh, that probably are not driven by, by searches that are given to them by language teachers, right? I like this quote from, from this chapter 
uh, longer uh, experimental studies are present, but the met excuse me, but the methodological design doesn't sufficiently cater for this. Longitudinal and delayed post-tests are essential if we are to test the claim that DDL leads to long-term learning along with other alleged benefits such as increased autonomy, noticing and language awareness, and that the skills acquired can be transferred to new self initiated areas. So these, I suppose, uh, self directed learning scenarios, again, could also attract our attention and maybe they are still not being paid uh, enough attention. Maybe it's, it's the right time to, to do that. Um, so I was wondering whether we could think of a type of DDL which is more driven by users and learners and less driven by teachers and researchers that also teach these learners, right? And I was thinking, well, now there is a whole range of web services and, and the use of artificial intelligence, the, the, the use of instant feedback, uh, and then really the, the urge to take into account the learners' interests and needs in language education is, is a plus, I think, and, and absolutely essential in, in language learning. So this is why I think we need, in a way, to reimagine the learner in, in data-driven and learning if if we really want to sort of explore opportunities that offer uh, alternative interpretations of data-driven learning in the context of new literacies and um, aka 2022 digital societies right and here i this is from from a paper that will be published very soon that i wrote with my uh, former pc uh, uh, the student Dan Yan Sang on, 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 on how there is some resistance from institutions to let learners go and how institutions feel that in a way they still you know have this power over what is competence in language learning and and how institutional ideologies about language learning determine how learners frame their experiences. It is almost as if we are in the box and it is so difficult to be, you know, just to just to be outside the box and see how language learning actually happens uh, uh, somewhere else. I was thinking of in, in, um, exciting opportunities for personalization and the use of data uh, through mobile devices, um, of course, other type of devices as well, but especially mobile devices that, for example, let learners put together their own dictionaries. And I'm thinking about in this context, again, this, um, this uh, initiative um, that I just uh, learned, to be honest, just a few days ago. This is called Lexonomy, right? This is an interface that lets uh, students compile and put together their own dictionaries and use their own dictionaries for language learning and to use this in a creative way. They can these dictionaries, they can pretty much do whatever they want with these uh, dictionaries, but it is learners that create their own dictionaries. Again, when you can think about it, you know, there is nothing more institutional than putting together a dictionary. I'm thinking about the Cambridge dictionaries, for example, here, right? So in a way, this is a beautiful example of how we can decolonize also some of these instruments and how this is happening, whether we want this or not, or probably the use of AI by most of us that probably don't need necessarily to know how to program in Python, how this is becoming more and more likely that we can just extract data from the from from the web and put together our own data set and start using these data set for our own purposes, right? So this is now, but I mean, just I can I can even just uh, think uh, what we can find in the in the forthcoming years. All right, so I will finish here by giving you just a few ideas that I think are worth looking at, and maybe probably this could be also part of our discussion. So 
I pretty much believe that if we push the boundaries, we can uh, start researching the use of data-driven learning in informal contexts. But of course, these will need that we think outside the box and we start to acknowledge the fact that language learning is happening every day and on, on the in, in, in terms of millions and millions of language learners out there using their mobile devices and their computers to learn language in the wild through interaction with a wide range of different uh, resources. So in a way, you know, uh, we develop digital research resources such as corpora, but there is a wealth of other resources that are language uh, um, driven which could be uh, interesting in, in terms of how we research how these resources are exploited or could be exploited by language learners, especially in multilingual contexts, right? Also the exploration of uh, constructs such as statistical learning might be, might be of interest if we want to part of our research to be more SLA driven or SLA focused. So that can also create these opportunities. And in very general terms, I think we have an um, opportunity here to reconceptualize and expand on the concept of data-driven learning by redefining the, the uh, boundaries of uh, future corpora, the use of, of corpora in, in across the board in different contexts, not only pedagogy corpora, but uh, corpora that are driven and that are put together by language learners how learners engage with linguistic data in, in these contexts, in these digital contexts, and also by a necessary effort in terms of how we widen our scope or the scope of our research methods and research designs. I think we have put together very interesting evidence on how a DDL works across, across uh, instructed contexts, but probably it's the time to move forward. So I will stop here. And again, thank you so much for this invitation, Peter, and I'll be very happy to discuss some of these issues with, uh, with our friends. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Pascal. Um, thanks, everybody for coming in. I think at one point, we had about 150 participants in the room, which is really excellent stuff. Uh, I've got a number of questions uh, that I've made a note of. Uh, before I do that, uh, Pascal, if I could just share my screen a second. Sure. Uh, oh no, yeah, I, I've got in the uh, the poster for the upcoming seminar here, which I'll just share with everyone. Now, this one, um, one. This is the only one that uh, we're not doing at this time, and that's because our presenter is presenting from the United States. So this will be seven o'clock in the morning in Brisbane, but nine o'clock p.m. in the UK, and the the Brisbane time there is Tuesday, but in the UK and in Brazil, it will be on the Monday. So a little bit confusing there. Do just keep your eye out on the time zone. But our speaker is Tova Larson, who's assistant professor of applied linguistics at uh, the University of uh, Northern Arizona, the, the Flagstaff Center, working with uh, Doug Viber and uh, Jesse Eckwood there. So uh, that is on research methods uh, with a focus on um, some corpus-based data-driven learning uh, ideas. So do tune in for that next week. But for now, uh, we're going to get into our questions for Pascal. And we start with a question from Rudy. Uh, Rudy Luke from the University of Lille in France. Uh, he mentioned that about translation as part of language learning uh, and to what extent is the use of software like Lingue or Parallel Corpora on Sketch Engine, for example, um, 
lead can, can that be considered as DDL uh, when students are say taking in data from a translation and coming to a decision about um, different versions, different translations and so on. Um, I think that's what Rudy's question is getting at. Um, so do you have any comments on translation and whether well, websites or mobile apps that do translation can can be considered? Well, yeah. Rudy, thank you so much for this question. Rudy, you are an expert in translation and corpora. So I'm sure I'm sure that you can, in a way, uh, um, probably um, um, be on top of maybe latest research in this area. My my impression is that coming from the computer assisted language learning community, there is lots of efforts to try to understand how language learners are using, you know, web services to uh, I mean how learners use web services to translate and evaluate the quality of their translations. And that involves lots of metalinguistic awareness, I suppose, and also examination of the, of, I suppose, some sort of regularities in this area. Uh, Godwin Johns, for example, he, he understands uh, automatic uh, translation as one area of, of informal language learning. And I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that there is, there is opportunities there for us to look at how cognitive processes uh, operate whenever we are trying to, for example, evaluate the quality of automatic translation. Uh, and also I'm pretty sure that this could be used in conjunction with, I suppose, corpus resources. Uh, but uh, to be honest, I'm not aware of research that has used data-driven learning uh, with um, uh, automatic translation, uh, or the type of automatic translation you can do with DeepL or or you know, Google Translate or any other service, but definitely that's a great area. It is. Um, I guess my take on that would just be that there will be studies out there that are firmly within call on the use of such resources, but it just won't. It won't have the name data-driven learning anywhere in the abstract, uh, or you know. So it. it it's one of those things that it may well be data driven learning and intuitively um, it makes sense that that's what they're doing when they're consulting these sources of information, but it's just not called DDL at the moment, maybe it could be. So great question, Rudy. I uh, hope that gives you the answer you were looking for. The next question is from Jia Chi Guo. Question is with regards to something you mentioned about meaningful input um a lot of research might use this term in a rather loose way without attempting to provide a definition in your opinion what does meaningful input mean so is it equivalent to example to Krashen's comprehensive in comprehensible input or input from real world interactions or so on and, right, uh, uh, Jachi, thank you. Yeah, thank you for this question, Jachi. You, you, you are an expert in how to model input. <laughs> so I'm sure that maybe you have your own take on, on, on this one. Um, there seems yeah, to be a recurring theme of researchers kind of taking their own research area and going like, is this DDL? You know? So that's, exactly. that's interesting, isn't it? It's, well, you know, I think that's, that's in a way that, you know, talks about you know, how well DDL may feed, you know, different areas of, of research and how likely I think, and that, I think this is a good thing, how DDL may expand on their own uh, epistemological basis, probably to also embrace new ways in which data, not necessarily corpora, the way we've known corpora for, let's say 40 years now, maybe, this can be expanding, uh, expanded to, to embrace new new types of corpora or a different take of corpora maybe. But coming back to the question, Jachi, I think that probably uh, what, is meaningful, uh, what is meaningful input? Um, well, I cannot interpret the quotation that, that I gave, so probably we should get back to the authors to try to know more about that. But I think is if we look at that from a usage-based perspective, meaningful input is the input 
that is involved whenever there is intent to communicate. So if the learner or the person that is learning the language without being necessarily a formal student of a language in an institution is trying to, is trying to start or to, to, to say something or to contribute to communication, that is meaningful input because this is input that is likely to be uh, to be um, um, adopted whenever these uh, learners uh, trying to to draw inferences or, or uh, abstractions uh, about the input which which is presented uh, 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 to them. So, and also I think that the question here is interesting. So who decides what interesting input is or in, in terms of learners? And the short answer in DDL, I think that typically it's been teachers and researchers. We have decided what is interesting input, right? So um, yeah, maybe there is room for other, uh, you know, takes on, on uh, you know, uh, learners in data-driven learning that decide to put together their own input and uh, start using that input to extract knowledge about the language that they're learning. Sorry for the for the long answer. Thank you, Pascal. Okay, I've just had a good question through from uh, Juan Solano Cardenas. Question is due to the increasing influence of technology in education, should DDL be considered a skill to be formally taught to learners as a learning strategy? And if so, what from what age would it be safe to do so? Well, that's a great question. Uh, I, I don't have an answer for that. I suppose if, 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 if by data-driven learning, you mean the range of cognitive skills that we adults show whenever we are trying to learn a foreign language, probably we could do more in, in, in language classrooms to promote those cognitive abilities. Or we could facilitate the presence of, of, of learning that facilitates those, those cognitive abilities. And again, uh, I think computational thinking is becoming very popular uh, across the board. So maybe that's a good area to read about how people doing computation, sorry, computation, uh, com computational thinking, how computational thinking uh, experts are trying to take these skills to the, to the language classroom. And computational thinking is not only learning, learning to program um, uh, is, is, is much more than that. So, well, if you ask me my personal, uh, just uninformed uh, opinion, probably in the area, I. I think again we could do better. I think we could we could probably uh, do better in terms of promoting these cognitive skills uh, among language learners. We know that metalinguistic knowledge uh, is is pretty effective in terms of um, language learning. So why not? Yeah, I certainly see a role for including such activities, say, within major textbook uh, units. A lot of Second, a lot of instructed second language acquisition in many contexts is based on only on what the textbook tells the teacher to do that day. And if more textbooks can carry such activities that allow students to use the technology in the class or outside of the class um, to be able to come up with some solutions to some problems that are posed in the textbooks, then that's where you'll get the buy-in at that level. Uh, that's where you start to see that broad broader appeal, I think, um, if things can be put into some of the key textbooks and tried to do that a couple of times uh, with work I've done for Cambridge on IELTS, for example, but we're still a long way from telling people, hey, go and consult this corpus and write down what you find and uh, share it with the class or share it with the people around you. Uh, we, we don't have that yet in the major textbooks. and. Maybe we have to take a little risk one day and, and, and produce something like that. Okay. Yep. Um, question from Adriane. Um, thinking about the implications for regular teachers who are not researchers and for whom our research may not reach them um, regarding 
you know, everything you mentioned about DDL for informal learning context today, um, what do you think teachers um, could and should be doing with regards to using some of this stuff? Well, um, yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think there's very interesting research looking at, at how trainee teachers embrace the use of corpora and DDL in the language classroom. One of those is one of your papers, Peter, on this, on this area, uh, 2020 or 2021, if I remember well. Um, so there is lots of interest in this area, one by Robert Poole also, just published uh, a year ago, I think, and another one in Recall recently. So there is more interest in trying to involve regular language teachers in DDL and the use of corpora in language education. I also did a, a, a little piece with uh, Malina Abad from the Instituto Cervantes in Manchester with UK secondary school teachers teaching Spanish in the UK. And um, well, that was, um, I mean, those are teachers. Some of them have 20 years experience. Some of them have 15 years experience teaching teaching Spanish to secondary school learners in the UK. And um, well, I totally agree with Angela Chambers 2019 paper on, on, on how far we still are from bridging this gap between research and practice and understanding practice in terms of, of teachers in language, in language classrooms uh, teaching uh, a syllabus, right? Uh, the syllabus was identified by our teachers in the UK as the main uh, challenge in terms of using DDL and corpus data. So again, I think I think it would really take to think outside the box. I think I think we are we are trapped in this wheel. Like, right? So um, teachers don't use corpora because they don't know about corpora. We teach them how to use corpora. They learn how to use corpora, but they cannot use corpora in their language institutions because of the lack of time and, and syllabus. So where do we go from there? I mean, um, can we can we rethink what we are doing here? Is 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 DDL is DDL possible without corpora? I don't know. That's that's uh, maybe that's a very un unpopular question. But uh, can we use other data sets that are more you know friendly in terms of their use in the language classroom? Um, I don't know. I think that's I think that's an open question, and and uh, yeah, but I think we we definitely need language teachers to 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 be on board, and I, I think this is happening in, in in a way. There is more research in this area. You can you can really you can really see that, which is very welcome, of course. Yeah, thanks, Pascal. I, yeah, I agree. I think it would take a very large scale big funded project, maybe Europe wide and, you know, uh, you know, in the States or something where it just you, you really take it and run with it. I think a lot of the, the work and the research is done is usually just when the researcher can get access to say one or two schools, there's not much really comprehensive at say the national level where unlike but i mean there's lots of money thrown into studies on uh call or uh, apps or um technology for learning various things but yet we still don't have that big kind of nationwide or kind of you know, big project on on ddl and i think that's something that i mean it's not for lack of trying <laughs> i've submitted enough funding applications myself but it's it's just something that can never seem to get off the ground because it goes to a reviewer and the review goes, oh, I don't understand this, so I'm not going to fund it. And it, yeah, it becomes a bit of a pain. Uh, I think we need something big like that, though, to, to, to get the ball rolling. I really do. OK, and we're probably going to have to wrap it up here, Pascal. I think a lot of our uh, oceanic audience is now 20 past 10 in the evening. Um, so I'll, I'd like to thank you again for your, for your contribution. I'm just going to 
kill the recording here.